Thank you. I, I'm loving these, you guys, because you're diehard till the end. Last conference slot. And having nothing to do with um, video games, or so, so you would think. But actually, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about, um, about the connection between video games and landscape architecture since Haim first invited me to, to come to IndieCade, because my first question when, when I answered the phone with him was, what's IndieCade? which gives you an idea of how out of the loop I am, apparently, on in, in video games. And then my second question, once he explained it to me, was why, do you, why would you possibly be interested in hearing me talk? And he, he gave me a little introduction like he just did. He's been researching Adventure Playgrounds. And since then, especially because I have, um, I have three children, but my youngest is 12, and he's very much into Adventure Play and video games, so I've been using him as a little uh, window into how these two topics are really related. So today I'm going to give you a little introduction to playgrounds. I, I started by thinking about in history of adventure playgrounds, but then I actually thought we needed to go a little bit further back to understand why playgrounds came about. And then I'm going to talk to you about the history of the Irvine Adventure Playground give you an overview of our design process as landscape architects for this particular park, and then show you what the new Adventure Playground will be when it reopens ne sometime next year. And then I'll give you a few thoughts of my thoughts about why that, uh, what's great about that new experience. So playgrounds really came about as a response to social justice issues at the turn of the last century. They, we had child labor, um, Children were working in factories, the, which were inhumane for adults, let alone children. And uh, a group of people, sp specifically in the urban areas, uh, Chicago and New York, were the first to start developing parks programs that dealt specifically with playgrounds. So this is an early playground, 1910 in Denver, and it gives you an example of what they were, they were designed like they were for free play, but it was organized free play. It was a time when both grown-ups and children would go out and use these apparatuses for exercise and get outside away from the factory and exercise. Um, and then in the 30s, there was an interesting, in Europe, a, Den a Danish landscape architect who was building those playgrounds realized that the kids were more involved and and doing more interesting creative things in the vacant lots than they were on his playgrounds. So he started developing junk playgrounds or adventure playgrounds. And they were based on giving kids um, free reign over their space and letting them build their own environments. These two tended to be led by grown-ups, interestingly. So still not exactly free play, but much freer than what had been happening before. In the U.S. in the 50s, uh, that idea of adventure playground blended with this very, uh, very interesting focus on form. So this is a, a um, playscape designed by Isamu Noguchi, who was an, a sculptor, but also doing a lot of landscape architect, ar architecture. And this was, um, is the 67th Street Adventure Playground by Richard Datner based on that idea in New York. Rec more recently, after pretty much in the 70s, is when this real concern in the U.S. for liability and being sued began to make all of our playgrounds less about adventure and less about loose parts and more about how can we design a place for kids to play where we won't get sued by parents who are angry that their child fell from too high of a height or something like that. So this is a, an example. It's a park that we recently... Um, we designed pro bono for the Trust for Public Land. It's in LA, it's one of, the, one of LA's 50 parks initiatives, and it's in some ways very innovative. It, ha it does have a little nature play area. Uh, it, does, it did use really great participatory design methods to come up with the design concept, but you can see the center stage of the playground is this huge um, off-the-shelf customized play equipment do give donated to the city. And the cities love this because it reduces liability, or at least 
they meet all the all the recommended guidelines for sit for play structures and they also require very little maintenance which is something that most of our cities are now that's their primary concern when it comes to landscape design um, Sarah had a great comment last session that landscapes change and landscapes not only change because of human intervention but they're because of the nature of nature they're ev constantly evolving so this is while this is great for adventure and creative play and beauty and seasonality um, it's really hard on cities with no budgets to maintain so that's the context that we're dealing with when we come to uh, Irvine's adventure playground this this playground began in a vacant lot which you can see as the the big white patch that's sort of organic looking um, inside of or right adjacent to University Community Park playground in Irvine and if any of you are from Southern California you probably and probably a lot of you who are not you know Irvine is the it's the first planned city in the US um, it's known for being extremely it's known for it's really the the epitome of the suburbs so every movie, every story that makes fun of the suburbs and that kind of cookie cutter design, it, they're really talking about Irvine. This is where it started. And while in the 60s and 70s that was a very innovative model for design, which it, it was, I mean, there's, if of any city, um, Irvine has enough parks, enough schools, all the things that so many of us wish we had more of in our cities. But it also means it was the last place you'd expect to see an adventure playground. So this, it started in a vacant lot, and there was a very, a small group of very um, proactive individuals working in the planning office at the time, which, which they reminded me during our community workshops that this was an innovative city. So I, I think this, uh, the, uh, the fact that there were at least two adventure playgrounds in Irvine, because I just found out about another one, speaks to that. It started as a mud lot. They had, we had gradual, change over time as kids and counselors came in and made it their own. There were ropes courses, structures built. This was a, a, an adventure playground that did have a lot of park staff. And as it became more and more popular, they required more and more staff to manage the kids. It was di the University Community Park is what we call a neighborhood park. It's really just supposed to be serve the very immediate community. But by the time, by the 2000s, there were busloads of kids being brought here in the summer to do uh, day camp field trips. And they had um, probably 200 kids a day on average. This is some of the things. It was predominantly a giant mud pit with some great fort structures that the counselors built. In 2008, I believe, or 2009, somewhere in the mid 2000s the playground was closed so that they could do renovations on nearby university on ne on the park next door university community park and then once those renovations were made w somebody in the community one of the previous counselors walked by and noticed a bulldozer sitting in the middle of adventure playground and he th started thinking w i better make some something happen so that we don't lose our adventure playground he organized, he found out that they were planning on bulldozing the playground. There were some issues that I'll talk about in a minute about why they couldn't reopen it like it was. And he gathered a pretty good community contingent to uh, petition the city council to save Adventure Playground. The city, uh, city council voted to fund a, design, a redesign of the Adventure Playground and invited us to pr give a proposal. We had written, we had, uh, been working with s the city of Irvine on several smaller community parks so we wrote a proposal to um, redesign Ir Irvine Adventure Playground from from my history of from my graduate studies I had done a lot of or some community participatory design um, for community planning and which is something that's much more common in the planning circle and not so common in private lands landscape architecture firms that are doing predominantly design. So we felt like this project of any, because the city 
and the Defend Adventure Playground group, which they called themselves, were very much at odds. They were, they were very much at odds about what might happen with the playground. And so we de designed a participatory design process to take the community through the history and the issues and then gather their um, ideas for what it might become. Going back to this, this is a, an overview of the history of Adventure Playgrounds. At the time, there were four on the, or there were three in California, which I'll show you, um, one in Washington and one in Maryland. And depending on how, it's a difficult thing to nail down because there probably are quite a few Adventure Playgrounds that aren't called that and that are much more informal in nature. So I'm hoping that there's quite a, quite a few more in existence. One of the biggest issues for reopening the park had to deal with, do with um, sediment, which this is a map of the watershed. The yellow circle is where the Adventure Playground is. It's right ac almost across the street from a tributary of San Diego Creek. And then that drains into the Newport Back Bay, which is a really, f a really important and fragile ecosystem. And San Diego Creek is named by the EPA as Im an impaired stream for sediment, which means that all the sand, it has too much sand and things being run, run off and clogging up the stream. Another issue is accessibility. This is the entry to the playground. The gates open to University Community Park, so you come through here and uh, go onto this gravel, and what you can't tell is each one of piece of that rock is like this big, so you can walk pretty easily across most gravel roads, but this is like road base, and it's really hard to walk in even for me with sneakers on. So you can imagine somebody who had mobility issues would not be able to get into that playground. And then another issue was the semi-permanent structures that the counselors built. They don't meet California building code, which is very um, particular about anything that's permanent. If these were, had been temporary, they might be okay, but they'd been up for a few years. So during our, we developed four, a uh, plan for four community workshops and we felt like the most important thing with participatory design is to reveal your biases and your understanding of the project. So we gave them a little history of Adventure Playground and then we talked about the environmental, economic and social contexts, how we understood it so they knew where we were coming from. This is a map of the plant communities in the area. Anytime, anytime we're, we're designing, we're thinking about what, what our contextual ecological systems are so that we can design with nature instead of against it, and that helps reduce maintenance, and it helps reduce water and energy being put into the landscape. We studied, did a little analysis shown here of the existing parks. Like I said, most cities would be very envious to have this many parks per capita. The yellow circle shows the adventure playground. Each one of those other parks looks like the pictures on top. So again, very manicured, very taken care of, very maintained, grass and shrubs and play structures. And what this told us and what we were uh, able to get the community, the city to agree on was that the adventure playground would be an adventure playground. So that it took that question off the table about having to save adventure playground and it became a participatory design process about what the next adventure playground would be. So the first two workshops we, we brought the community in and we asked them what they wanted it to be. We, we gave them the issues so that they understood it had to be accessible environmentally friendly, um, up to code, which of course they understood and, and agreed with. And then they gave us their ideas. We acted as a third party between the city and the community. And that was really important because we needed the community to feel that, that we weren't, um, that we weren't swayed by the city city's need for low maintenance spaces or desire to close down the, the, the project and we needed the city to understand that we were very much in favor of working with them, which we were, um, to make sure that it wasn't, didn't become a burden down the road with maintenance. The, the most important thing with this process was to make sure that everyone had a chance to be heard and to see that we understood what they were asking for. So we collected their 
their top priorities for design attributes and elements. These are elements that they wanted in their playground, the first two being um, building, a building component, and the second one being mud or water. And we very quickly told them there would be no mud that just didn't meet health code, environmental code, building code, or the maintenance issues. And they, I mean, they still put that voice up there, which was great. But w they, uh, they understood, even though it was their second priority, they probably were not going to get mud. And then the attributes that they were most interested in was getting it open as quickly as possible, having it open all year, every day, anybody could walk in. They wanted it to be very accessible. They also wanted it to use natural materials and a lot of other things that I'll go over in a minute. So then once we had harnessed their that knowledge, and we continued to work with the community through, we're still working with them, showing them our design options and our details, but that was, those were the biggest, um, biggest sessions of community involvement. We went back to our studios and began designing, and the next phase of our design process is research and analysis. So we made sure we understood the environmental context, especially the stormwater issues, because we were now required to treat and manage all stormwater on site. And the site, as you can see, it's shaped like a bowl, which makes it both um, ideal to keep water in it and really hard to um, get it out unless we were to raise the drain, because the drain was at the very bottom of the, and it drained right out into the gutter and into the creek. So it, what happened was it actually became a really easy sell to the city to have water standing water in the park. And then we wanted to understand the history of the environmental context. So this is a map of historical wetlands in Southern California along that coast. And the idea is that we only have about 2% of our wetlands left in California. It's the most endangered habitat. So we felt like the Adventure Playground was a great opportunity to restore, uh, just have a small piece of that habitat brought back for wildlife and bugs and all the great things that kids love to see and interact with. The other, one of the big, big wishes from the community group too was not no plastic, which I was just speaking to somebody before this. That's a really easy thing to say and a really hard thing to achieve in a playground these days, as you'll notice now every time you go to a playground. The social context is really under, um, important to understand as well. Our kids today, this is a map from Kaiser Family Foundation showing how much media exposure kids have. And it's, it's, mu it's higher than you would think because this is complete exposure and it doesn't account for overlapping, like when kids are on their phone and their iPads or watching TV and on their computer. But it's still, it would be really interesting to go back to 1979 when I was growing up because you wouldn't even have a um, computer on the graph. That number would be zero. And then we're also, a lot our cities are very concerned with this epidemic of overweight children. You can see here the colors on the bottom show most of the country in 1990 of children were in the 10% maybe 10 to 14 percent range for childhood obesity and uh, 20 years later most of the country is well over 25 percent of kids being overweight and this has been one of the a real driver in getting parks close to our children and getting kids active outside so we our takeaway for that was we need to make sure this adventure playground is really great to get those kids outside the next process was we went to go visit several parks that we thought would be good models for the Adventure Playground. In um, telling our story about what we wanted to design, it's really important as somebody who's spending, proposing to spend quite a bit of city funds to make sure that the city or your client feels like that design is viable. And one of the best ways to do that is to say, well, they've done it here and it's worked. So we use case studies a lot in our design process. There, we, we first looked at the, the three adventure playgrounds that we knew to be in California, Huntington Beach Adventure Playground, which is still 
around was very much based on water play or mud play. And the reason they can do that is because they haven't shut down. So you're grandfathered in in terms of stormwater codes. And I'm not sure about the health codes, but I, I think that, you know, the stormwater at least is, they don't have to do anything to change that until they close down. The next one we went to is your Belinda Adventure Playground, which is operated as a day camp during the summer. So you can sign your kid up for two or three weeks. And this was in the spring that we were visiting these, so we didn't get to see it in action, but it was very similar to the Huntington Beach Playground. And then Berkeley Adventure Playground, which I'm sure Haim is familiar with. It's like the epitome of adventure playgrounds. If you ask anybody uh, who knows adventure playgrounds to name one, the Berkeley Adventure Playground is the one that comes up first. It's an adventure playground on steroids. This, we went in May, so the only way we could see it in action was for us to test it ourselves, which is really great. The same woman has been managing this playground since it opened in the 70s. And she's, uh, she's amazing. I th I'm, I'm sure you talked to Patty. Um, it's based on that building, building your own environment. And the kids come in each summer. And they have to go through a little mini training session. They earn the right to have a tool. And then they can go build their own forts or use the ropes courses. There's a zip line. And then there's just gallons and gallons of paint on everything that you see. It's, it's a really beautiful, wonderful place to be. And honestly, I, I was very skepti skeptical of having any building element hammer and nails because of the maintenance issues and staffing issues until I w experienced it for myself. And then I was like, OK, that's, that's a really great model. So, But we also wanted to open the conversation to something besides that traditional, at this point, model of adventure play, which was based on hammer and nails. Because while I knew probably two of my three children would be really interested in that, they're, they're, my daughter would have zero interest in that. So how could we broaden the idea of adventure to include things like nature, or growing plants, or doing things that required zero staff? And because we knew that was a possibility with the economic context we were working in, we, we really needed to cover that base. The Berkeley Edible Schoolyard was right next door, so we visited that, and that's been, that was um, funded by Alice Waters, the chef, and it's been a really great model for harnessing kids' energy. You can see in that lower right picture, these kids are, we were sitting there and they just decided to make their own pizza. There was no teacher around, they had made their their dough and we're sticking it in the oven and it was really great. The straw bales were a nice way for kids to be able to shape their environment, moving them around, and then the kids had a lot of access to picking fruit and vegetables. This is another little park that had just opened in Sierra Madre, which is a very tiny community north of Pasadena. It's the Milton and Harriet Goldberg Recreation Area and it was designed for nature play. So the all the elements are natural materials. The top left image is just slabs of tree trunk laid on the ground and with little logs to sit on. And then the kids have access to more tree trunks and sand to build with. Um, the little fountains at the bottom are very d just, uh, just deep enough to capture a little rainwater so they don't pose any danger of drowning. And they let the kids play and interact with water. And then the entire park was planted with the help of the community, which we thought was a really great way to harness community ownership. And then the last one we went to visit was a city park to show that you can have natural materials in a city park. This is a City of LA park, Vista Hermosa Park, which overlooks the City of LA and incorporates some really interesting elements that, while they weren't being called adventure play, I felt like they were. This little boy at the bottom right is standing at the bottom of a waterfall. I don't know how well you can see that. And kids can rock, climb up on those boulders and play in the water, although there are signs that say don't play in the water because it's reclaimed water. But they can play in the water and um, watch the fish or just have a quiet space to sit in. There were plenty of shade trees. And then this um, walkway on the bottom left is it feels like dirt and looks like dirt, but it's actually a stabilized surface. So it's very low energy to create it, but it still feels like 
a natural surface and most importantly it's accessible. So that after we gathered all of that information and thought about what we wanted the new adventure playground to be, we came up with our first preliminary design. Um, and this shows different elements. It's you get the char you get the feeling of it and the character of it. It's it has at its base, at its center, a wide open meadow, which would be something other than grass. We're looking at buffalo grass right now, which is a very low water um, native plant to Texas. And it, you don't have to mow it very much and we can allow w wildflowers to grow through it. So the city, the city actually really likes it. What we liked about it was it changes color over seasons, something that very few Southern California children get to see. And it, it doesn't require a lot of mowing. So the kids could have space. We um, were putting some posts in the middle of the meadow so that kids could do lean-to forts with tree limbs or put blankets around it and make a little teepee structure. Um, that way they can stay up for a few days without getting mown, you know, mown or in the way of being maintained. We have a sensory garden, the, the circular um, garden to the lower right is a sensory garden and that is, I'll go through it with some images in a minute, that was made, that was inspired by a blind garden that we saw online, uh, uh, I can't remember where it was, but it has raised beds so that somebody walking through it with a cane could get go around by themselves and not have to be led. It's, it's filled with textural and aromatic plants and a quiet space to be for those kids that don't necessarily want a lot of activity. We have in the center a, a living pond coming through that starts at a waterfall that's, uh, that's the water is started by children pumping the old farm pumps that maybe some of you guys got to play with. When I was growing up and going to camp, we had those really hard to pump farm pumps and if you really got working at it, you could get a good stream of water. So the kids can get water themselves, let it go down the waterfall, and then it goes into the living pond, which is doubling as a stormwater treatment basin. And it also uh, feeds some native wetland plants down there, which are actually growing on the site. The, the site has some willows and wetland plants growing at the bottom because it is, it already is shaped like a bowl. And then we have a, a camping area, a, some play structures that you'll see, and a climbing wall and rock climbing, rock boulder hopping area. And then a little administration area with a place that you could fence off down the road if the city were to decide we're going to have hammer and nails and we have money to staff that. There's a place to do that really well. This, this is a sheet of images that describes each area. So on the very left column is what we imagine the new entry area to be with a structure, an administration structure for somebody to hang out in. It would have picnic tables for parents to perch and be able to overlook the entire park. It would have plenty of room for painting. We actually, the city, we decided to go with that bottom option, a shipping container, a used shipping container, modified somewhat to house the administration building. So we're doing that. The second area, the second column down shows some uh, the ideas that we're using for the physical challenge area. And that is, there's big boulders, there's a rock climbing wall, um, trees that you can actually climb, which is very rare in our city parks. There's a zip line and a ropes course going in. One of the things we wanted to really stress, or I was very, very felt was very important, was space for more imaginative play. So we do have a little theater with an amphitheater, um, places a place to play dress up or be quieter, a little quieter with your group of friends away from the more active, rambunctious kids. The sensory garden is the images shown on top of the yellow color. And those are plants that would move and make sound with a breeze or smell good or that you could touch and that would be f they would be soft and they would all be housed in these raised beds that are easy to get around and uh, um, actually give kids a little um, quiet place to sit by themselves, which is really important. The water's edge is a treat water treatment area, but it also allows a little space for reflection 
and brings, um, as soon as you have a bit of water, a tiny bit of water anywhere in a backyard or a park, you get dragonflies, fish, birds. We thought that would be a great way to bring the site to life in a different kind of adventure. And then the last area, the last column is the build your own adventure area, which is that meadow. And it allows flexible space to change over time. We have, it's ringed by willows that are growing both naturally and that will add to, and we're putting grasses and rushes and things that Native Americans use to make baskets and their houses. And this is an opportunity for a different kind of building. And we thought, you know, we're in 2013, we're really trying to push green design, ecological design. So why would we have these kids learning how to build with bad plywood and hammers and nails when we couldn't have them build with cob walls or straw bale structures or weaving, you know, making their willows into huts and tunnels, which, which a lot of them were really excited about. These are some of the, the city bought into this. The city loved this, the community loved this. And the minute we left the community uh, during our fourth, fourth workshop and went to meet with the city to kick off the next phase, which was design development and construction documents, they said, we love it, it's great. Now make everything you can with off the shelf play equipment. <laughs> so, you know, fortunately we had this really great city approved document that said natural materials, all the benefits of those things that the community wanted. So, but we also had to agree that the more we could provide off the shelf, the quicker the process, the quicker the park could be built, and the less liability the city would have. So we found a company in Europe that has play structures that are built all with wood, and they provide really great backup resources for cities that show they have a five-year guarantee, they can ship individual timbers to replace rotten timbers if they need to. So even though it's in Europe, which I have issues with the transportation costs of that environmentally and economically, it's a, it's a safe model for the city to use and it's already um, meeting the European standards, which aren't so different from ours. These are the treehouse structures that the kids, all the kids were drawing treehouses. And I mean, who doesn't love a treehouse? So this was one that was a, a little bit more of an interesting modern design and um, again by that same company. So they have a really great maintenance over time policy. And a ropes course, it was same, same thing, which is a pretty good compromise. The rock climbing wall was, is one that we're designing ourselves. And this is a, took inspiration from a, a wall that was designed as a retaining wall in San Diego which the image there that just was became this impromptu climbing wall because it was designed with rocks that had enough little footholds in it. So that was um, that was huge for me because how many playgrounds have you been to with the little plastic cling on, stick on kind of climbing things? I felt like if we could just keep pla plastic out of the park, I was going to be happy, and we managed to do that. And this, um, I can give you guys a link to that entire document if you want, because it's online with the city of Irvine. So the reasons why, just to wrap it up, th that I think this is a new direction in Adventure Playground, not just because when, when people hear formally hear Adventure Playground, they think of that building with hammer and nails, but it's really a new Adventure Playground, um, a new direction in playgrounds that is taking off in a lot of different groups that are trying to get kids more access to nature. It's uh, a lot of groups are interested in how we bring wildlife habitat into the city parks and then stormwater treatment is huge. And those three things kind of join together to make this an ideal model of playground. Some of the benefits are that kids find restoration in quiet areas. I went to a conference a couple weeks ago for uh, giving kids access to nature and one of the one of the teachers said that it's her autistic students are the ones that will go leave the, the turf and play structure area for when they've had too much and they'll go off and find a quiet little natural space to sit and recollect and restore their, their well-being. So we need to think about access as not just physical access but also access for kids that are um, 
with autism, autistic spectrum disorder, or other mental differences. The nature play fosters collaboration and imagination in ways that competitive play doesn't. It's even, even a play structure can be looked at as a competitive environment because there's one kid that can be on the top or one kid in line at a time for the slide. And nature play doesn't allow for that. It, it's uh, Richard Louvre has this really wonderful book called Last Child in the Woods. If you haven't read it, it's a great resource for all of these ideas. And he's, he s cites studies that, s that show kids playing in nature play much more collaboratively and they learn social skills where kids that aren't doing that are not. And then it provides, uh, the new Adventure Playground provides this multifunctional design opportunity, which is really the basis of ecological design. How many things, how many redundant systems can you have in a place so that you're treating stormwater, providing shade, providing habitat, providing beauty, um, human comfort, uh, and bringing a site to life as well as offering play opportunities. That's much better than a, a plastic play structure or rubberized surface that's really doing one thing. And then I think maybe most importantly, where the new Adventure Playground can inspire the next generation of environmental stewards. This is my littlest when he was like two. And this is my, him 10 years later um, running across the LA River. And he's one of the biggest advocates just being out in nature and for environmental health and justice. He's also a really great creative kid. And I bet most of you played in nature because creative people tend to have that history behind them. They're, there's a, they're just as interested in the natural world around them as our built systems and technologies. And this, I think, um, for me, really brings home why we're all here in this room today. My son really loves this game, Minecraft. I mean, he could spend, he would spend eight hours a day on this game if I let him. And at that same conference, it was really interesting. This man had just finished a documentary film on getting kids out in nature, and he had talked to dozens of kids and asked them why, why were they playing on video games rather than being outside in nature. And their response was, you can shape their own. Well, what he gleaned from it, I'm not sure that they said this directly, but what he gleaned was that they had so much control in, on video games to shape their own environments. And so many of our natural areas, you go, to the botanical garden and you're told don't pick the flowers, don't pick up the rocks, leave everything behind, you have zero ability to shape your environment. And even in our parks that are geared towards kids, you have turf, rocks, and trees. Maybe, maybe, if you're lucky. But if you're not lucky, you just have a plastic play structure with rubberized surface under it and no ability, again, to shape your environment. So it's interesting that the very first meeting I went to for the Adventure Playground design, the city of Irvine staffer, who I adore, we were sitting in this room next to the Adventure Playground and there was a big tree outside the window sitting in the grass and there's this two kids playing in the tree, climbing the tree. Like every, you know, everybody would wanna sit in that tree. It had these really low branches and he looked over and both Marie and I, Marie was the project manager for city of Irvine, were just like, oh, that's so sweet. And he looked over and he got up <laughs> He said, I'll be right back. And he went outside, he yelled at the kids to get out of the tree and he came back so that it's, real, it's, it's a very rare thing to have that ability to shape your own environment, explore your own environment and just feel empowered by where you are. And that's what our hope is with this new adventure playground. And that's it. So questions? Yeah. 
We're, we we actually thought about th that in terms of when we first were doing our design, we were providing three options. And we had them divided in by phases. So one would be if you could open it as soon as possible with zero staff. And then the second would be very minimal staff, but a lot of programming to do, like you're saying, have an adult or a volunteer or a community member come in and show the kids how to do basket weaving and ha show them how to harvest grasses so that you're not killing the grass. Because that, I agree, that's really important. And our intent wasn't, with the design, wasn't to like, oh, go at it. You guys can do whatever you want to any of the plants. It was actually, there were different opportunities and we're working with the city's programming person who develops the preschool and after school programs to make sure there are ideas, community members who can lead them in that. Because I think that's, that was one of the things that the community, the Defend Adventure Playgrounders really loved about the Adventure Playground was that sense of mentorship and guidance. So even though the park can, can act completely unstaffed or with one person staffing it, it, act, it can respond better, I think, if there is some programming and some mentorship happening. So that is, that's the hope, that you would get people in. The willows can stand there and the kids can come and play in the meadow just however they would play in the meadow with zero adult supervision, but then there also can be these opportunities for somebody to come in and teach kids if you harvest grasses this way, you can keep the grass alive and use the materials in this manner. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. that informs the different zones. Yeah. Shelter, yeah. There, mm, no, I mean, I, I think it depends on who, you, probably if you talk to a, a playground expert, which I'm not, you, they would say yes. Um, or a, actually a children's play expert, not a playground expert, because they would, yeah, they would probably say yes. And, and I've been involved with several groups lately where there are those experts in the room that, and they do need. So I think that's more of a play theory understanding rather than a landscape architecture understanding. Although we do definitely work in terms of how, how are we setting out the programmed space. And those things came about more from our research on nature play and actually my understanding as a mom than from a designer's guide for landscape architects. Because we, we're in such a broad field, every project that we do, we have to do a lot, quite a bit of side research to get enough understanding to say, okay, can we develop? And that's why collaboration is so important to us, working with the city to understand their needs, working with the community to understand theirs with every project, even if it's a home garden or a school, which we do quite a few university campuses, we're, we're probably our main skill is that ability to talk to everyone in the room and bring it together into a design. I think it would have been really different had there been a different community. And a, a friend of mine works at the Trust for Public Land in the city of LA doing community workshops to build small parks. And every park is different based on what the community wants. I mean, there are some similarities because, it, like I said, city forces tend to be very similar. So it's amazing how similar things can, could, can be when you, your city doesn't want any maintenance and doesn't want liability and, and doesn't want um, custom or can't afford custom 
custom design, but they, they tend, out, tend to be very, very different. So one of our, we did two, we designed with them two city parks for this tiny little town, city of Maywood, which is one of the most park poor communities in the US. And one of them was very, it is uh, shaped like a snake, the walking path. This was literally, the park is about as big as this room, maybe a little narrower and a little bit longer. It's 6,600 square feet. And it's um, this tiny little path and it has a couple little play structures like this tall for the kids to get into, a little waterfall and a, a shelter, a picnic shelter. And a lot of native plants because stormwater treatment was huge. And the other park is much bigger and they were much more interested in play equipment, having some things to climb. So the, the, main, the main feature of the park are these gigantic animal-shaped um, structures that are completely tiled because art, public art is a big component of Trust for Public Land's work. And they're, they're tiled really intricately and you can actually climb into the mouth of one of them and slide down the back. Or There's different, different features, so they're very, very different playgrounds based on the, the community's need for that. Um, so yeah, and I think even depending on where, where we're designing, it would be different based on the the ecological context, this, the architectural context. We're really, I, th I think Sarah was, you were mentioning that in your last, I wrote it down. It's funny, I'm talking to you and where's Sarah? Um, sense of place. I mean, that's really important in landscape architecture. And I think, I never really quite thought about it as being important in any kind of game or play or storytelling, but that's where I feel like we put most of our focus as a firm is understanding the context, whether it's the people, the history, the architecture, the environment, and making a place that feels like, even though it's very designed, it doesn't feel like it was designed. It feels like it just happened. Yeah. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, actually, uh, we, we do have, like, the entire water's edge is sand and water. The city wasn't willing to do mud, and actually, I wasn't either as a responsible designer because that would have, it just has really, really serious impacts downstream. But sand and water can have a similar, as similar play value. And so we've, we've w one thing that we've been fighting really hard as the city, city teams are changing and the city's understanding of the project has changed over time, which is also some a, vi a very big challenge when you're dealing with changing clients. One thing that we're really fighting to keep is the sand. The idea of mud play might happen, in, but not formally. We would never call it that. I mean, you have to be really careful with wasn't cast saying the same thing. You have to be really careful what you call it. But we have a willow area and place to build tunnels with willows. Well, that's we know that's going to also lead to a little digging here and there. The 
the, the hillsides that have to be really well planted for erosion control. We didn't put paths through there on purpose because we know the kids will make their own paths and find little places to hide and create little nooks. We, we know that will happen because just the, the amount of shrubs that are there. We've been working really hard with the city maintenance team. They've been meeting with us from the beginning and to, to because this is Irvine, everything is pruned, mown, it looks perfect, it looks immaculate, everything. I mean, there is not a single tree that hasn't been touched. It's not like in West Virginia or Ohio where I grew up where you have acres and acres and acres of woods to play in as a child and there's no maintenance team going in and making sure the trees are all shaped perfectly. In Irvine, they do that in the parks. So the maintenance team for this, we've they've agreed um, to not, they al allowed us to not have a wide, too wide of a walkway. They wanted to have a 10 foot walkway so they could drive their cherry picker in to top, tap, to prune the trees. And I said, what if you don't prune the trees? And they're, because we don't want you to prune the trees and we really think it's important to have a very narrow path for a children's, a child's scale uh, space. Otherwise it just feels like that's no fun. There's no adventure there or mystery. And they, he agreed, they agreed with the caveat that somewhere on the website or the door out front, there would be a note, this is not maintained per city of Irvine standards. They, they didn't want anybody calling them and being like, oh my God, the park looks like nobody's touching it. So there are, there are places like that. And the other, you know, that picture I showed with the rubber, rubberized playground surfacing, which I have real issues with on a lot of levels, but one of them is you can't dig in it. My, my kids' favorite park where they grew up in after school care had just um, tons of sand around the play structure. And they dug in it, they put the sand on the slide, made it go really fast, they made things with it, they'd get it wet. And so we have sand in specific places. Now sand isn't an accessible surface. So it's really, you have to balance that with, we are using wood fiber, wood chips for the accessible surface, but that can also be used as loose parts and can be dug in. And the last, uh, the city is, was on board, on board, the project manager turned over, and now the first question they asked last week, we're, we're done with our CDs, but the first question was, why don't we have rubber surfacing everywhere? So I think w the conversation will continue until it's built and we'll, we'll keep fighting. You know, we have this whole document, na natural materials, places to dig, and that's one of the best reasons to really document that whole process and have a narrative is you can go back as pl people change and the players change and the context changes and say, oh, it's because of this, 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 and this. So. But the snow is what I miss most about living in Southern California because it it's truly the best environmental play tool, material. So he asked whether this project has affected other projects that we do that are not adventure playgrounds. And I th it has. I, it's, it's one thing that it's done for our firm because I'm, I've, I work in a traditional landscape architecture firm and what I really love about that firm is that they've been executing really high quality design for 50 years. This is why I went to that firm. But I came in with the understanding from my principles that I would be the person to push them into sustainable design. This was seven years ago when we were, even in landscape architecture, we were just starting to really understand practicing sustainable design or ecological design. So what it's, while it's, it's really strengthened my belief in the importance of these spaces and it's given me um, really good material to express that to other clients and it's given our project team faith that it's possible which sometimes probably there's you guys all know that person that's the technical guru but has zero vision until they see it done well, we have a lot of landscape architects probably like we're half and half half a creative visual 
um, visionary people, you know, and then half, maybe it's even like a quarter visionaries and then three quarters technical, get it done exquisitely, but you better show me an example that it's worked before because I'm not going to visualize that on my own. So it's helped our in-house team, I think, really see that, no, this is possible. And it's not just possible in some tiny little city filled with um, bohemian, you know, kind of nature lovers. It's possible in the city of Irvine. So th- and that has a lot of weight. And I think it's one of the best things about it being in the city of Irvine. We know it'll be done well, <laughs> no matter what the outcome. It will be done well because it's the city of Irvine. And that'll give other cities some, a little buoyance in, oh, yeah, we can do this. This is viable. This is totally valid, you know. Yeah. And I think that we've, we've been coming on a very slow, regular evolution towards understanding that nature play, not just nature play, but access to views of nature and um, natural systems in all of our environments, whether it's schools, yes, but also healthcare, campuses, um, apartment buildings, you know, you name it, industrial parks, offices. We all are restored with views of nature. And that's, that's been, this park, this project definitely helped sort of one more nail in the, I was, uh, that's a really bad analogy, but <laughs> <laughs> one more, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> That's right. Thank you, guys. Thanks.